Order. The uh, following message from the Senate has been received. The Senate has passed a bill for an act relating to the law to be applied in determining certain questions relating to foreign corporations and for related purposes and transmits the same to the House of Representatives for its concurrence. Clark. First reading, a bill for an act relating to the law to be applied in determining certain questions relating to foreign corporations and for related purposes. The Honourable the Minister. Uh, Mr Deputy Speaker, I move that this bill be now read a second time. The Australian Government recently looked at the legal position of companies incorporated abroad which do business in Australia, whether through a branch, local subsidiary or otherwise. One finding was that an Australian court may be called upon to make a decision on a dispute involving such companies by referring to foreign laws, and may well find itself in a situation where it has to choose between conflicting laws of two or more foreign jurisdictions. For example, the court may have to address such questions as the validity of the incorporations of a foreign company, the ownership of shares of such a company, or, more generally, the rights and obligations of a foreign company. As a result of the examination, the government concluded that in some circumstances there were no clear and predictable statutory rules which would overcome the uncertainties relating to claims of corporations of unrecognised states and governments. It is the policy of the Australian government to encourage foreign investment which it judges to be in the national interest. The government wishes to ensure that investors can make important decisions in the confidence that their legal rights in Australia will not be adversely affected by extraneous considerations such as the legal status of the territory in which their business is incorporated. The Australian legal system clearly meets this objective in most cases and obviously provides impartial legal services of high quality. However, it has become apparent that the traditional common law approach to the position of foreign corporations under Australian law may not, in some cases, adequately take account of the changes in the international trading system and foreign investment patterns in Australia. Within Australia, there are now corporate entity entities from diverse political and legal systems and with various ownership arrangements. The sums involved in investment are often large, and it is understandable that in such circumstances investors require certainty as to their legal status. In some countries, for example the United States, the courts have clarified the legal status of the companies incorporated in unrecognised entities. However, this is not the case in Australia, and the approach an Australian court would take in dealing with a case involving the rights of foreign corporations from some parts of the world remains unclear. This bill seeks to address these issues. It deals in general terms with the situation where an Australian court has to determine the legal rights of a foreign corporation by reference to foreign law. Thus, when the ordinary rules of private and international law require that rights of a foreign company be determined by reference to a foreign law, the bill will ensure that the law to be applied will be determined by the place of incorporation of the company without regard to the political circumstances. Questions of official recognition or otherwise of the government authorities there or the legal status of the place of incorporation. The bill's approach takes into account the government's change in recognition policy announced by the then Minister for Foreign Affairs and Trade on 19 January 1988. Under that policy, Australia no longer takes a position on the recognition or non-recognition of particular government. governments. Australia recognises states only. Mr Deputy Speaker, the government considers that it would now be appropriate to provide for protection of the legal rights of companies incorporated in unrecognised entities. Australian courts, when confronted with cases in which foreign relations questions are raised, traditionally have attached considerable importance to the attitude of the executive government. The Australian government's view is that as a matter of public policy, the foreign relations considerations should not normally be the overriding factor in the determination of private legal rights, particularly those involving commercial transactions. The government considers that Australia's public policy interests can be preserved on the one hand, while on the other hand, normal commercial relations between private parties can be determined by reference where relevant to the law in fact in operation in the place of incorporation. There is no financial cost to the Commonwealth 
I note, however, that the passage of the bill is likely to attract additional foreign investment uh, in Australia. Mr Deputy Speaker, uh, I commend the bill to the House and I present the explanatory memorandum to this bill. I understand that it is the wish of the House for the debate to be on the second reading to be proceed forthwith. There being no objection, I will allow that course to follow. I call the Honourable Member for Ryan. Mr Deputy Speaker, the Opposition supports the uh, bill before the House. As a consequence, I won't take long in dealing with it. As the Minister has pointed out, <coughs> it does uh, clear up an area which has been uh, a gap in commercial uh, practice in Australia for some considerable time and uh, is well overdue and it's bringing us forward. This bill uh, proposes new legislation to ensure that certain questions arising under Australian law in relation to foreign corporations will be determined in accordance with the law applied in the place of incorporation. And this is particularly important, as the Minister just pointed out, in non-recognised uh, countries. This is designed to protect the status and rights of foreign corporations, and in particular those corporations in states and governments not recognised by Australia. Um, as a consequence of that, the bill has come forward and uh, we support it. I think, uh, Mr Deputy Speaker, uh, the most pertinent point really is, uh, of course, our relationships with Taiwan, uh, where, who uh, are very <coughs> substantial traders with Australia. And I might just uh, point to the uh, very impressive uh, growth record of a rather small island, uh, which I haven't been to, but uh, I've read from time to time about, and the very impressive economic record that they've been able to put together. Um, 25 years ago, Taiwan was an aid recipient. Today it has, and with virtually no resources, it has $75 billion worth of foreign exchange, the second only to Japan's. It was the 13th largest trading nation in the world in 1988, and expected to be the 12th largest this year. It had an average growth rate of almost 9% a year over the last two decades. It had a trade surplus of 12 billion in 1988. Now that's not bad in Australia, you should think a bit about that. Had a per capita income of 6,053 American dollars in 88. This is not far from the formal prosperity cutoff of 8,500 per capita of GDP. Taiwan's per capita income in 1989 is expected to be above the 7,000 American dollar mark and would rank it in the top 25% in the United Nations uh, were, it, were, were it a member. It is presently the most affluent country in Asia outside Japan. <coughs> I draw this uh, brief record uh, to the House's um, notice because um, the type of legislation we have before us does give some protection to investors uh, based in that country, um, in corporations, in shareholders, and certain contractual obligations, bearing in mind the, uh, the prospect of substantial investment coming from that area uh, to Australia in the next few years. You can't be running the surpluses that they are without looking for foreign investment and in a country which has very little natural uh, resources, as I understand it. Uh, that's quite obvious that they would be uh, looking for outside uh, areas of investment, one of which I've read about in recent times is a company called the China Steel Company, which is a very substantial operation, uh, and I think anybody investing that sort of money, employing that sort of numbers of people, would seek a legal uh, base in Australia, and that's uh, afforded to it under this bill. So, Mr Deputy Speaker, I won't detain the House. So the opposition supports the bill. And I look forward uh, to continuing investment opportunities from those countries that are now afforded recognition under this bill. The question is that this bill be now read a second time. I call the Honourable Member for MacArthur. Thank you, Mr Deputy Speaker. I too, uh, like the Honourable Member for Ryan, will not take a, a great deal of the time of the House in dealing with this particular piece of legislation. Um, I believe probably one of the most significant parts of this uh, bill, in fact, is uh, mentioned, as was in fact mentioned by the Minister in his second reading speech, in that uh, he believed that the passage of the bill is likely to attract additional foreign investment into Australia. 
I mean, the legal niceties and so on, I'm feel sure that the lawyers in this place can deal with, but that's the part of the legislation and its effect that uh, greatly appeals to me. The Honourable Member for Ryan made some comments about Taiwan and what that might mean for Australia in the future, and in particular about uh, China Steel and its proposals for expansion and perhaps even expansion into this country. Uh, I have in fact been to Taiwan and seen the operation both of China Steel and uh, held uh, some discussions with people within economic ministries there and do appreciate those sorts of concerns that he's raised. But of course he's not, uh, with, with regard to Taiwan, it's not just that country that we should take note of. We are inexorably linked to Asia and uh, we have to continue to press for a trading relationship between countries like that, but more importantly also to our traditional trading partners, Japan, China itself, uh, Thailand and so on. Now each of these in our geographic region are going to be, over the next uh, several uh, years, more and more important to us. The fact that this legislation removes any difficulties of interpretation about application of law in a commercial sense between Australia and indeed foreign entities uh, goes some way therefore to remove some possible impediments to continued investment or future investment in this country. One thing that I did want to say though about investment is that um, there is something of a misconception or a, a fear in Australia that investment in this country is something to be shied away from particularly if it comes from people that are perhaps our near neighbours rather than from America or from Great Britain or whatever. I think that that is absolute nonsense. I think the fact is that Australia is always going to have to be dependent upon foreign investment to develop. We have certainly our own entrepreneurial class in this country and of course in recent months uh, the quality of that entrepreneurial class has been called into some degree of question but notwithstanding there are people that have invested in Australia uh, doing so and are creating employment opportunities. On the other hand we are going to more and more need to have people from foreign countries being prepared to put money into Australia create jobs in this country, certainly profits will flow back to those countries, but notwithstanding, without that investment and the productivity and, and the other investment within Australia that comes from that, uh, this uh, nation of ours is not going to prosper. The fact also, Mr Deputy Speaker, is that uh, uh, we are removing any concern about, uh, about um, political circumstances equally is very important. And uh, as the Honourable Minister indicated in his second reading speech, it does, I think, apply to certain nations uh, more than others. Uh, to that extent, and the fact that many of these nations do have considerable and vast sums of money available, running major surpluses as they do today and are looking for opportunities to invest, we as a, as a country, we as a government should be in a position to encourage that sort of investment here and we should welcome it. Frankly, I'm quite pleased to see that the opposition is not uh, uh, to oppose the legislation. Uh, obviously uh, within it there isn't anything to oppose and certainly as I've indicated the lawyers on both sides of this place would take a great deal of time to argue the merits or otherwise of some of the provisions if there was a, a problem. So uh, with those few words and in, in keeping with the spirit of the debate as uh, entered into by the Honourable Member for Ryan, Mr Deputy Speaker, I too, like the Minister, commend this piece of legislation to the House. It will overcome a problem that has been in existence for some time, but uh, of course uh, the government, as ever, always willing to look at opportunities for uh, advancing commercial relationships between Australia and overseas countries, has done the right thing by the introduction of this legislation, and I too commend it to the House. The question is that this bill be narrowed a second time. I call the Honourable Member for Bass. Thank you, uh, Mr. Uh, Speaker. I uh, just want to take one moment to uh, add my support uh, uh, to the uh, words of the member for Ryan. I think this bill is particularly significant. It goes through with the bipartisan support of uh, both sides of politics. This bill is about Taiwan. It is particularly significant that there has already been mention of the China Steel Project. That is a project that uh, we would all like to see proceed uh, in Australia if possible. There are employment uh, benefits to be gained. Many unionists have spoken up publicly about their desire to see it proceed. But I think the broader issue that is being debated here tonight about Taiwan is, well, where do we go from here? 
This is but a first step with regard to uh, policy that we took back in 1972 under Mr Whitlam. And I think that, uh, and I speak personally, that perhaps our policy is uh, due for review. The economic uh, advancement of Taiwan to make it now our sixth largest trading partner back in 1972 it was about our 14th. We have uh, a healthy trade with them in commodities uh, ranging from uranium, aluminium ingots to wool and beef and we import from them a whole range of manufactured products. They have the second uh, highest level of uh, reserves after Japan. They are one of the economic powerhouses in Asia at the present, and they will become even more uh, uh, significant as time goes by. Their population is equivalent to that of both uh, New Zealand and Australia combined, some 20 million people, and I don't believe a country that is performing economically as well as it is can uh, be ignored. It's, uh, it's our folly if we do. From Australia's point of view, it's trade or perish. And I make the point uh, quite strongly that I believe that the, uh, the underlying thrust of our policies now ought to be to be promoting trade in all sorts of areas, but particularly in the Pacific Rim. We find that our other trading competitors, notably the Canadians, are heavily involved in Taiwan. And I think uh, we uh, are giving away markets unless we pursue more vigorously trade policies. The fig leaf approach that we adopt with Taiwan, we trade with them but we won't uh, diplomatically recognise them. I think uh, this bill re is really a step towards uh, recognition that is long uh, overdue. There is complex issues, I admit, that need to be dealt with, very complex issues of a diplomatic nature with regard to the People's Republic of China. I think uh, with some... Uh, some uh, I think with some imaginative policy uh, that are available to us that have been adopted by other countries in the region, we can see the opening up of more trade opportunities, we can see the opening up of uh, airline links, and I think that Australia will be the richer if we take that uh, more pragmatic approach. I think the days of uh, diplomatic niceties um, uh, should be behind Australia. As I said, I think it's trade or perish for us over the next little while, and uh, we need to be part of Asia. The Garno report uh, makes that point very, very strongly that was released recently. Mr Fitzgerald, the former ambassador to the People's Republic of China in his Morrison lecture, makes that point also. And I think uh, the winds of change are about, and this bill uh, is a significant one, and it does, as I said, enjoy the bipartisan support of this parliament. And I think that we are sending a message to Asia that we want to be part of Asia in that trade. And if I can uh, urge the minister to uh, accelerate uh, the government's attention to the matter of uh, Taiwan, and if I can declare an interest, I have been there. And um, I uh, was particularly impressed uh, with the frankness with which they deal uh, with the issues. They are complex issues about diplomatic recognition, but I think that we need to uh, increase that dialogue, and it will be to our mutual benefits, and more particularly to the benefit of the whole region. The question is that this bill be now read a second time. Those of that opinion say aye. The contrary, no. I think the ayes have it. The clerk. Second reading. A bill for an act relating to the law to be applied in determining certain questions relating to foreign corporations and for related purposes. Is it the wish of the House to, to proceed to the third reading forthwith? There be no objection. We'll follow that course. The Honourable Minister. Uh, Mr Deputy Speaker, I move, that the, move the third reading forthwith. The question is that this bill be narrowed a third time. Those of that opinion say aye. aye. The contrary, no. I think the ayes have it. The clerk. Third reading. A bill for an act relating to the law to be applied in determining certain questions relating to foreign corporations and for related purposes. The honourable member for Throsby. Thank you, Mr Deputy Speaker. Mr Deputy Speaker, on behalf of the Parliamentary Standing Committee on Public Works, I present the 26th report of the Committee for 1989 relating to the refurbishment of the Reserve Bank, 60 Collins Street, Melbourne, and I move that the report be printed. The question is the report be printed. Those of that opinion say aye. Of the contrary, no. I think the ayes have it. The Honourable Member for Thrasby. I ask leave of the House to make a short statement in connection with the report. Is leave granted? There be no objection. Leave is granted. The Honourable Member for Thrasby. I thank the House. Uh, Mr Deputy Speaker, in the report I have just tabled, the committee has recommended the refurbishment of the Reserve Bank of Australia, 60 Collins Street, Melbourne, at an estimated cost of 25 million at June 1989 prices. In recommending that the work proceed, the committee has drawn attention to a number of matters. 
The committee is concerned that staff will be occupying floors while asbestos is actually being removed from these floors. The committee has recommended that the Reserve Bank examine the need for this and also that strict safety measures be at, are adhered to during the asbestos removal. The committee has questioned the need for modifications to the ground floor facade at an estimated cost of $800,000 and has recommended that the Reserve Bank re-examine the need for this expenditure. Finally, the committee has recommended that the Reserve Bank give consideration to the provision of additional toilets for the disabled. The committee does not believe that the provision of only one toilet for, for the disabled in a building of, of 17 storeys is adequate. Mr Deputy Speaker, 1989 has been an extremely busy year for the Public Works Committee. It has tabled 26 reports held public hearings and inspections in all capital cities except Adelaide and also in many regional centres. The committee held 66 meetings during the year, made up of public hearings, inspections and private meetings. In total, during 1989, the committee recommended the expenditure of $1,100 million on pub public works proposals. As chairman of the Public Works Committee, I wish to express my appreciation to all committee members, in particular my deputy, the member for Wide Bay, Clary Miller, for their dedication to the work of the committee in what proved to be a very demanding year. In fact, apart from 1972, when 35 reports were presented, including projects in Papua New Guinea and local Northern Territory projects, this is the highest number of reports the committee has presented on purely domestic projects. I also wish to place on record my appreciation to the Secretariat staff, especially the Secretary, Mr Peter Roberts, for their work and support, often under trying circumstances through the past year. I commend the report to the House. No further speakers to the report. The Honourable the Leader of the House. Mr Deputy Speaker, I ask the Leader of the House to move a motion relating to the printing and circulation during the long adjournment period of a report by the Standing Committee on Industry, Science and Technology. Is leave granted? There being no objection, leave is granted. Will the Honourable the Minister? I thank the House. I move that one. If the House is not sitting when the Standing Committee on Industry, Science and Technology has completed its report into small business, the Committee may send its report to Mr Speaker or in the absence of Mr Speaker to the Chairman of Committees, who is authorised to give directions for its printing and circulation. Two, the foregoing provision of this resolution, so far as it is inconsistent with the standing orders, have effect notwithstanding anything contained in the standing orders. The question is the motion be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. Honourable Member Deacon. Mr Deputy Speaker, uh, we have no objection to the motion that the Leader of the House is putting forward, but uh, in view of the fact that this report has been um, for coming and coming and coming for some months now, I would appreciate some guidance on uh, the day in which uh, uh, the Leader of the House thinks that this uh, might be published. Simultaneous with the Liberal Party's health policy. <laughs> <laughs> Sometimes, for some time before February the 20th, I think. <laughs> Otherwise, I wouldn't be moving the resolution. I wish I could help the Honourable Member, but I'm afraid I can't. <laughs> <laughs> the question is the motion be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. Of the contrary, no. I think the ayes have it. The Honourable the Leader of the House. I move that this House at its rising adjourn until tomorrow at 9.30am. The question is the motion be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. Of the contrary, no. I think the ayes have it. The Clerk. Government business. Notice number one. Oakley Multi-User Army Reserve Depot, Victoria. The Honourable Minister. Thank you, Mr Deputy Speaker. I move that in accordance with the provisions of the Public Works Committee Act of 1969, the following proposed work be referred to the Parliamentary Order. Standing Committee on Public Works for consideration and report. I refer to the Oakley Multi-User Army Reserve Deposit in Victoria. Mr Deputy Speaker, Honourable Minister. Yes. this proposal is for the construction of a multi-user depot at Oakley, Victoria, for use by various Army Reserve units. The construction of the new depot is primarily the result of a request from the Victorian State Government that the site of an existing depot in Batman Avenue, East Melbourne, adjacent to the National Tennis Centre, 
be vacated for use as open space. The Commonwealth agreed to make the land available to the Victorian State Government. As part of a wider Commonwealth State land transfer agreement, involving various properties in Melbourne. In relation to the Batman Avenue depot, defence relocation costs were to be met and the Commonwealth was not to be financially disadvantaged overall. The construction of a new depot will also allow rationalisation and co-location of like Army Reserve functions, which is consistent with this government's policy of rationalising and upgrading defence facilities. A suitable 3.17 hectare site for the construction of the new depot has been purchased at Oakley, some 16 kilometres from the Melbourne Central Business District. <clears throat> the site, which was previously an abattoir, includes disused and derelict buildings unsuitable to form part of the depot complex. Australian Construction Services, with approval from the P Public Works Committee, have commenced demolition of these buildings, which is expected to be complete by February 1990. The proposed work, in addition to the demolition work, includes construction of office, administrative and storage facilities, training facilities, a vehicle compound, parade ground, recreational and some food preparation facilities, as well as car parking and security fencing. Landscaping and engineering services for the site will also be undertaken. Once complete, this depot will provide a home to Army Reserve headquarters and units of the Royal Australian Engineers. Royal Australian Electrical and Mechanical Engineers and the Royal Australian Army Ordnance Corps. The provision of multi-user or shared accommodation for various units of the Reserve Army is current defence policy and is considered a cost-efficient approach to defence accommodation. The new depot at Oakley will be constructed along these lines. The limit of cost estimate for the project, including demolition work, is $9 million at November 89 prices. As stated earlier, demolition work is expected to be complete in February 1990 and construction of the depot is planned for commencement in mid-1990 with completion expected in late 1991. The impact of the proposed work on the environment has been determined as minimal and the site at Oakley is appropriately zoned as general industrial. Construction of the new depot will provide in the order of 20 to 25 jobs on site, as well as opportunities for local contractors and suppliers of building materials and equipment. I table selected drawings of this proposed work and I do commend this motion to the House. The, the question is that the motion be agreed to. The Honourable Member for McKellar. Uh, Mr Deputy Speaker, the opposition supports this reference to the Public Works Committee. Uh, might I say, although the, I notice the Leader of the House has left us, he was here a few moments ago, that it is quite hard at the moment for the opposition to respond adequately to proposals from the government because although there have been two weeks of uh, recess of the uh, House of Representatives, it still doesn't seem to be possible for the government to follow the normal processes. We were assured that we would have a copy of the Minister's uh, a speech on this matter this morning, but didn't have it until late this afternoon. Um, and uh, it seems to indicate a, uh, a difficulty that the government has. Well, it just it just indicates the. Uh, it just it just it just we have a number of other things to do. And uh, and well, the honourable minister might take this matter seriously. This morning we had a severe lecture from the leader of the house on the management of government business. And uh, he was blaming the Senate for its rule of setting a deadline for when matters should be considered by the House of Representatives before they went to the Senate, which I thought, in fact, uh, would have been quite a sensible matter for the Senate to set some sort of deadline if the government doesn't exert any discipline over itself. And in a case where the government does have two weeks of recess to prepare all the matters for this two-day sitting, and yet the two-day sitting is an absolute shambles. We simply don't know what's going to come up next and we don't have adequate warning of it. However, nonetheless, we do our best to consider these matters rationally. And in this case, um, we have a proposal to be referred to the Public Works Committee uh, to uh, move a defence facility from East Melbourne to Oakley. Um, and uh, that seems to be a rational proposal. Uh, it frees some land in East uh, Melbourne um, for free space 
um, and it uh, unifies a number of reserve facilities uh, within Oakley, and that seems to be a perfectly sensible proposal. Um, I was a bit disappointed that the Honourable Minister didn't, uh, in his introduction, indicate that this might in some way be helpful to the 1996 uh, bid of uh, Melbourne for the Olympics in the on the grounds that it would provide further uh, open space in East Melbourne, which is one of the main positive moves of uh, uh, Melbourne, or one of the main positive arguments of Melbourne for the Olympic Games, which the opposition fully supports. Indeed, as a Sydney sider, if I can say to the Honourable Member for the, the Minister for Aboriginal Affairs at the table, uh, and Member for Melbourne, we're very, very firmly in support of this bid. And, um, and if I may say so, I thought it was rather amiss of the Honourable Minister, even though he does come from uh, the Wollongong area, not to mention that this might be another positive argument in favour of the Games for, uh, for Melbourne. Um, these proposals, which might appear to be of a pedestrian nature when they come before the House, are very important um, for the armed services. They do represent quite considerable expenditures on the defence vote. Um, as the Honourable Member for McEwen, I'm sure, would agree with me, um, that as he has military facilities in his electorate, um, these, uh, these proposals are of great importance to the armed forces. They, over a period, gradually upgrade facilities, which in many cases, and I've been visiting them one by one over the last few months, um, in many cases are, are quite decrepit, um, and in this particular case have the additional advantage of amalgamating a number of facilities for the reserves. And uh, uh, I sh I'm sure we share um, a concern uh, with members opposite about the reserves. The minister himself admitted in a 7.30 report um, debate recently that the government had not got the reserves right, um, that there is a concern about how the reserves are managed, and so that we hope that this new multi-user um, army reserve depot in Oakley uh, will assist the, um, the improvement of facilities for the reserves and uh, make the reserves more attractive to recruits, which is an important uh, objective. So, in that sense, the uh, opposition supports uh, this reference. The question is that the motion of the Honourable Member for Deakin. Um, yes. Mr Deputy Speaker, um, I'd just like to uh, say at the outset, if I may, that uh, I think that the Minister, who's... Uh, presented this motion today has been a victim of the government's inefficiency. Uh, my colleagues' uh, comments about the failure of the minister to provide the information uh, to us arose uh, firstly because we were originally told the government planned to bring these, uh, this motion and two others that follow it on uh, very shortly after the start of business this morning after the matter of privilege had been dealt with, which we were told would take half an hour. Uh, we were then told that uh, they were not expected to be brought on today at all. Subsequently, we were told that they would come before the, uh, oh, before or, the House. Order, order, the Minister has a point of order. The point of order is that the matter before the House is not currently being uh, addressed by the member speaking. And I'd ask that you rule and bring him back to the matter before the no, House, no. rather than a history lesson in what may or may not have happened oh, this morning. Min Minister, I think you would agree with me that, uh, that the Speaker made a, a, a sweeping reference to something that happened this morning. I don't think we should get too panetic at this hour of the night. Speaker, I think it's extraordinary that the Minister uh, should uh, make this intervention when I'm trying to get his mate off the hook by explaining that the government's inefficiency has created a situation where the, min where the Minister for Administrative Services where the Minister for Administrative Services found himself in a position where he wasn't able to deliver. Yeah, well, and, uh, and, and I should also say to the Minister, since he's interjecting, that, uh, well, uh, that uh, look, today... Well, order, order, I think, like... It'll save a lot of problems All if we right. just talk well, about well, the, Mr. Deputy Speaker, the reference I won't before. Him, I, won't, I won't let him off the hook, and uh, I just want to say, I, I just want to say this, uh, if I may, Mr. Deputy Speaker, that uh, this uh, this whole business was a grubby little deal, a grubby little deal between Hawke and Kane, wasn't it? Because uh, during the Victorian election campaign. Kane, the Premier Kane said to, to the Prime Minister, hey, listen, I'd like to have that piece of land off Batman Avenue so we can have some open space around uh, Flinders Park. And uh, all you need to do, all you need to do is to be assured that, uh, that we will make available to you another piece, another piece of, you give this to us, we will arrange 
uh, for something to be to be given to you. So this is uh, really, uh, and you're involved in this, we'll get to you in a minute. This is just another one of these grubby little deals. And Mr Deputy Speaker, I can tell you that, uh, that I was uh, closely involved in this because the Commonwealth has some land at Nunawadding, uh, where the ABC is located, and there was a proposal to relocate uh, this uh, depot uh, out at Nunawadding, but the local, uh, the local residents objected very strongly to all this. And Mr. Deputy Speaker, this is a—I mean, this is a, a typical, this is a typical Labor fix, and we all know that Keynes on the nose down there. And no wonder you're in the house because you're fussed about it. Keynes on the nose down there. This type, this type of deal, Mr. Deputy Speaker, is the kind of order, deal. Order, order. The come minister to has a point of, of order. What is going on? Order, order. The minister on a point of order. My point of order is that there is a matter being brought forward by the minister which the first speaker from the opposition addressed uh, that issue. The second speaker, the current speaker, it hasn't even addressed the matter before the House. And quite frankly, I resent uh, the comments he's making because they have no relevance at all. And I ask you to draw yeah, yeah. his attention to that and draw him back to the matter before no, the House, or I'm we'll give him grubbiness. Yes, I must say, I, I do agree with the minister on this one. I do think the speaker has uh, perhaps um, uh, exercised his latitude a little bit too widely and perhaps he would draw his uh, comments back to the Oakley multi-user army reserve depot. Well, which, which, which was located from, uh, relocated from Batman Avenue. Yes, Mr Deputy Speaker. Well, I can understand the Minister's sensitivity about Victorian matters because he's been uh, at least uh, partially responsible for the extraordinary mess that's existed down there in the transport system. I mean, you and your prancing order, around order, down order, there. Order, order, look, the, 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 <laughs> order, point of order, the member. Look, I, look, Mr Deputy Speaker, I just want to put it on the record that uh, I believe, and this is to my point of order, that, we, that, w that this House has given uh, too much latitude already to the member for uh, Deakin, and if he wants to continue like this, well, then he might put us in the position that we don't want to be in, where we may be no longer be heard. Yes, uh, uh, the, the, the member, member must appreciate that it is quite late. It's been a very trying day for us all, and I really do think that he should keep his comments to this reference that's before us, the Oakley Multi-User Army Reserve Depot, and all these other matters he's talking about. Perhaps we can debate those at some other time when I'm not in the chair, but if he could just keep his comments to the motion before the, the House at the calling, moment. Calling your bluff, baby. Um, well, thank you, Mr Deputy Speaker. I just want to say, I mean, I just want to say that in talking about the relocation uh, of the existing depot in Batman Avenue, we are talking about a shoddy deal, a shoddy deal. This is about Batman Avenue and Oakley, a shoddy deal done between Hawke and Kane just like the VEDC, just like Trico, just like the State order, Bank, order, just the, like WorkCare. Order, care, order, just, order, order. If, the, if, the member, if, the member, if the member doesn't restrict his comments to the reference before the House, I will have to sit him down. And the Minister, what were you going to say on your point of order? Exactly that, thank you. The member, and please keep your comments to the uh, reference before the House. Mr. Bluff, Mr. Deputy Speaker, he said that if I uh, made any reference to uh, the shoddy deal that took place down there, he'd move that I no longer be heard. No, but, uh, uh, he was on his feet on yet no. another point of order. I don't think he. Anyhow, look, I don't. Uh, I don't want to go on, uh, Mr. Deputy Speaker, about Trico, the VEDC, about uh, work care, and about the mess that the Minister for Aboriginal Affairs has made about the transport system down there. Uh, the, minister, the Minister. The Minister on a point of order. I, I require you, as the, as the person occupying the chair, to, to apply yourself to the standing orders and address the Speaker on, of the Opposition uh, who is defying you and defying the standing orders. Yes. And every time you pull him up, he just gets up and continues to talk about everything else other than the matter before the House. Well, I think we can, uh, we can uh, get over this by moving to the, to the next reference. I think you have finished the member for Deacon. Well, well, if, if the member for Deakin does keep defying the chair, I've asked you, I've tried in the spirit of the, of the House, of the spirit of the season, to be, to be lenient with you. If you are going to keep defying the chair, I will just ask the clerk to call on the next uh, uh, well, item of business. I'm, I'd like to speak to the point well, of if order. You, now, look, I, I think I'd like that to speak we should... Well, 
I, I actually agree with the point of orders that's been raised by both of the ministers, that you have wa uh, ranged widely away. We are dealing with a specific uh, reference, the Oakley Multi-User Army Reserve Depot, and it's got nothing to do with various other aspects you've brought up. I thought you were going to make passing reference to those ones. You've made passing reference to them four times, and if you're not prepared to either speak distinctly to this, uh, I will then ask you to resume your seat and then I will call the clerk to bring on the next item of business. So it's up to you. If you want to talk to this, you can. If you want to arrange widely, I will just bring on the next item of business. Mr. Speaker, may I speak to the point of order raised by uh, the minister? Mm. Well, uh, the minister said that he requires the chair, requires the chair to take certain action. And I submit, Mr. Deputy Speaker, that that is a... Uh, that is an aspersion on the chair, that no reflection on the chair, that, that no member can require the chair to do well, anything. I, I, the chair itself, and I think that, uh, with great respect, Mr. Deputy Speaker, you should ask the minister to reword his point of order in such a way that he simply isn't seen to be issuing orders well, to you. It, it because the way it sounds at the moment, he is requiring you. No. I mean, uh, Mr. Deputy Speaker, if he can require you. To, uh, to ask uh, me to take certain action, then surely I can require you to allow me to continue the remarks that I was making about the shocking state that exists in the state of Victoria and the well, difficulties. Well, uh, well, and well, the difficulties. If you let me reply to the point you made, it yeah. seems to me that everyone's very free with their advice to the chair. As I understand, it's the role of the chair is to keep order in the House and to draw. Uh, the members' attention to uh, when they stray from that point. Now, as I did in the very early part, and uh, I was, I think, rather lax, instead of pulling you up immediately, as I said before, I thought you were going to make a brief reference to it, then come back to it, but you persisted in making it. And uh, I think that what the minister was doing was drawing my attention to my responsibility in occupying this chair. Now, I think I don't want your advice either, thank you. Now, I think that if the member, if the member has any further comments to make, he can make them now, specifically to this, otherwise we'll move on because there are, the, it is getting late. Deputy Speaker. Uh, the I, member for McKellar. No, Warringah. Warringah, sorry. That's quite Warringa. okay. I, I think that the, the, I speak further to the point of order raised by my colleague. Uh, I heard over the, uh, the sound system, you being required to take certain action by the minister at the table, one of the ministers at the table, mm. my colleague has quite rightly raised the point that you should, in the exercise of your authority in the chair, be impartial. You should not be required by the government, by any minister, to take any, any action. You, you simply ought to reject that and to continue as you have, Mr. Speaker, Mr. Acting Speaker, put you and the position you occupy in, uh, in a certain amount of... Uh, under a certain cloud, and I think that you should reject well, that because the position that you occupy is the most senior one, well, and I think you should reject that requirement from the minister and do so quite specifically. Well, I, I thank the honourable member for Warringa for his, uh, his advice. As I said before, everyone's very free with their advice to the chair. Perhaps if people abided by the rules of the House when they are, when they are speaking, we wouldn't get into this position. So I ask that honourable member for Deacon, have you concluded your remarks? Well, if you can continue and, uh, and uh, stick strictly to the reference before the House, and if you don't, I would ask you then to resume your seat and I'll ask the clerk to call on the next item well, of business. Mr Deputy Speaker, may I, may I speak again to the point of order? Well, I, think we've can well, I, I really do think, the Honourable Member for Deakin, I do think we've canvassed that issue quite enough. It is very late. There are other members, if the Honourable Member Minister would let me finish, there are members here waiting to speak. There are members who have been waiting all day to speak to this, and I think that we should proceed with the business of the House right now. So I'd asked you to restrict your comments to the Oakley Multi-User Army Reserve Depot. If you have nothing to say about that, I would ask the clerk then to call on the next item of business. Well, you know, if you want to hear about the shoddy deal, I think you should get, leave the chamber and hear about it somewhere else. Interjections are not called for at this time of the night. Well, Mr Deputy Speaker, I will, uh, I will um, 
I will tell my colleague. Uh, well, you're, you're a free to do that, about, but I suggest about, you stick to what. Yeah, well, I, I suggest I just, you stick to what's on the well, paper here before you. I, now. I do, Mr. Deputy Speaker, and uh, and I remind the House, and I remind the two ministers at the table, that we are talking about the relocation of the existing depot in Batman, Ave Batman Avenue, okay, close to close to uh, close to Flinders Park. Okay, uh, Mr. Deputy Speaker, um, I, uh, well, it, it was Clyde Holdings. But uh, I don't know where it is now. Um, I, I remind the, the House, Mr. Deputy Speaker. We should refer to the minister by his appropriate title. I thank the honourable member. I think the uh, the member knows that, and uh, and will bear that in mind in future. Yeah. Member Mr. for Deputy Deacon. Speaker, uh, we are talking about the relocation of uh, the existing ba uh, depot in Batman Avenue out to Oakley, I was saying in speaking to this motion before the House that the reason that we have this relocation from Batman Avenue adjacent to the National Tennis Centre out to Oakley is because during the last Victorian election campaign there was a shoddy deal done between Prime Minister Hawke and Premier Kane. And that is the reason, Mr. Deputy Speaker, that is the reason that is the reason that this motion is before us. Nothing could be more pertinent to this motion than the fact than the fact that we had this extraordinary grubby deal, grubby deal between Hawke and Kane out there. And you know it too, and you are up to here with the disruption the that is going keep, on in, Mem the, in uh, the Melbourne should, on, the, uh, on the metropolitan transport system. I'd ask Mr. the minister Deputy. not to interject across the table. I'd ask the um, honourable thank, member, thank. your time's almost expired, so... Uh, oh, Mr Deputy Speaker, that's a shame with yeah, all I well. have to say about the shocking behaviour of uh, Hawke and the Victorian government, given that everything that's happened about this uh, Batman Avenue situation. Well, Mr Deputy Speaker, if I could just conclude, because you're right, my time uh, is expiring. Uh, I mean, this kind of Batman Avenue deal, the VEDC, Trico, the State Bank, Work Care, and what this minister has done with the transport system down in Victoria is the reason that people are absolutely fed up with the federal government down there and why at the next election we're going to win a swag of seats. The, quest the question is that the motion be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. Of the contrary, no. I think the ayes have it. The minister, could you control yourself? The clerk. Notice number two, stage one redevelopment, Puckapunyal, Victoria. Minister. Thank you, Mr Deputy Speaker. I move that in accordance with the provisions of the Public Works Committee Act of 1969, the following proposed work be referred to the Parliamentary Standing Committee on Public Works for consideration and report. I refer to stage one redevelopment, Puckapunyal, Victoria. I this is a very important project, the Puckapunyal Military Area, which of, uh, is situated in Victoria, approximately 11 k's west of the town of Seymour and 100 kilometres north of Melbourne, and it was originally established as an army training centre for new recruits prior to and during World War II. Puckapunyal has been the main training centre for the Armoured Corps since 1942. I might just say before the member for Deakin, isn't it, leaves the House. I, I, I've investigated. The, the honourable member shouldn't interject. He shouldn't I, interject from anywhere, least of all there. I, I've investigated the time given the uh, statements and allegations made by the shadow minister as to the time he received these speeches uh, today. And it's always been my practice to extend the utmost courtesy to my counterparts in the opposition, as indeed I have already done on the material for the electoral bill tomorrow. I have ascertained that as these three speeches were delivered, uh, were intended to be delivered to Mr Bill this afternoon, he was nowhere to be found and the parliamentary liaison officer uh, has indicated to me that uh, the speeches were given to the opposition's whip, whip's office at 3pm. Now, as the, time at the, as, as the time was around about 11.30 when those allegations were made, it seems to me to be incredible that the opposition spokesperson could come into this place and criticise me for, for uh, 
belatedly giving him a four and a half minute speech when in fact they were given to him eight and a half hours earlier this day uh, and given to the whip because he couldn't be found anywhere. So that's the situation and I, I trust that we'll mem- hear no more talk about discourtesy by me to members of the opposition when the protocol is that they get the speeches not more than two hours before. And I've given it to him eight, tried to give it to him eight and a half hours earlier, and they were nowhere to be found, and they were conscientiously delivered to the opposition whip. So let's have no more nonsense about this sort of thing. Anyway, this military area at Puckapunyal is currently uh, home base to three major operational units, two of which are part of the operations deployment force. A newly formed logistic battalion, three major training establishments and various minor units. It's considered to be a significant defence base by the Australian Defence Force, employing approximately 2,000 servicemen and women. The area consists of uh, three distinct and special purpose zones. The range complex covers uh, 42,500 hectares of forested and open space and including weapon ranges uh, is all used for training and is capable of brigade size exercises and live deployment of all major weapons deployed by the Army. Puckapunyal is the only training area in the 3rd Military District permitted to conduct field firing manoeuvres without external restrictions with the exemption of fire bans. The military uh, cantonment or soldier accommodation is located in the southeast corner of the range complex and includes accommodation for Army Reserve soldiers participating in training camps or, training camps or courses at Puckapunyal. The third zone is the Puckapunyal village, which includes married quarters for service personnel and dependents, which at present totally approximate, approximately uh, approximate 2,200. A number of sporting and recreational facilities are also present on the base to assist defence personnel to maintain a high level of physical fitness. Environmental effects of the redevelopment work have been determined to be minimal. As the work is restricted to buildings and facilities within the confines of the Puckapunyal military area and an environmental certificate of compliance has been issued. In terms of community needs, Puckapunyal does have some shortfalls. However, Defence are taking positive steps to improve facilities and a study is being conducted by the Australian Defence Families and Information Liaison Staff is aimed at identifying shortfalls through liaison with the Puckapunyal community. The redevelopment is directly in line with the government's firm commitment to improving existing living in accommodation and rationalising and modernising working accommodation and facilities as stated in the Defence Policy Information Paper titled The Defence of Australia 1987. The proposed work currently before this House is the first part of a two-stage redevelopment program for the area and will basically involve replacing substandard living in accommodation, upgrading engineering services and replacing refurbishing working accommodation to house the newly formed Puckapunyal Logistic Battalion. Specifically, some of the accommodation at the base was con- constructed in the 1960s as temporary accommodation for the then National Service Training Battalions. This accommodation is now below scale and standard and has become a maintenance liability. The proposed work will include replacing the substandard accommodation and constructing additional bed spaces for rank and file and senior non-commissioned officers. Upgrading of the rank and file kitchen and dining facilities and construction of a new mess for senior non-commissioned officers also form part of these new proposed works. Present facilities cannot adequately accommodate the various systems and equipment that have evolved over the years to keep pace with defence technological advancements. Increases in occupational health and safety requirements and the service of scales and standards of accommodation have meant that deficiencies now exist in working accommodation at Puckapunyal. These deficiencies have, have had detrimental effects on some functions. Replacement and refurbishment of existing buildings will be undertaken in order to provide purpose-designed working accommodation for the Puckapunyal Logistic Battalion. Engineering services at Puckapunyal were originally designed with a much smaller military population to support. 
these services are now inadequate and are becoming a costly maintenance exercise. Refurbishment of services such as water reticulation, wastewater systems and road and drainage structures will ensure that necessary systems are kept operational and ongoing maintenance costs are reduced. The proposed Stage 1 redevelopment work will be undertaken in two phases, with work to commence on Phase A in the latter half of the next financial year. Phase B is not expected to begin until after 1994. The second and final stage of redevelopment at Puckapunyal will address less urgent requirements, as well as include any improvements to community facilities, as identified by the study currently underway which I outlined earlier. The limit of cost for the proposed <coughs> stage one work at July 89 prices is estimated at $31.5 million. This figure consists of $9.5 million for phase A and $22 million for phase B. The redevelopment work at Puckapunyal military area will provide opportunities for businesses in surrounding country areas for the supply of building materials and equipment and provide up to 55 jobs on site. <coughs> Mr Deputy Speaker, I do table selected drawings of this proposed stage one redevelopment of Puckapunyal military area and I do commend the motion to the House. The question is that the motion be agreed to. The Honourable Member for McKellar. Uh, Mr Deputy Speaker, the uh, opposition uh, supports this reference. Uh, if I could respond to the remarks about the Honourable Minister about the uh, presentation to the opposition of the, the material relating to this development. I don't want to make a federal case out of it, but um, basically one does try in this place to program one's day as best one can. Um, I have a background in business and uh, all I can say is that uh, coming into parliamentary life and political life one has to make adjustments um, and I certainly do that. Um, but uh, the program for these two days of final sitting has been chaotic. There have been a number of uh, targets for the debate on this particular matter, and I was informed that the material would be available this morning, mid-morning, and I program my day according to that. I have a number of other things that I have to do, a number of important committees, not least of which is one concern with our preparations for government. Yeah, well, and, uh, uh, so if, I, if I could just interrupt the member there, uh, we've all had a very trying day. I've also had a very trying day, so we won't lament that. But uh, what we should be referring to in this reference is if this work should really be uh, referred to the Parliamentary Standing Committee on Public Works, and I think rather than lamenting what a hard day we've all had, if we can just keep our remarks to that, we'll get out of the House much earlier than otherwise might have been the case. Now, I don't want your advice either, the Honourable Member for Deakin. You can give me your advice when you're at the microphone. Otherwise, just keep quiet. And I now call the Honourable Member for McKellar again and ask him to keep his comments to uh, this, uh, whether this motion should be referred to the Public Works Committee or not. Well, Mr Deputy Speaker, I concur with your remarks and I won't make any further comment. I think I've made my point on the response to the Minister's remarks in his address on this matter. Uh, the works here are similar in a way to those in the earlier referral motion. Um, they are the important underbelly of defence operations. Um, they are quite expensive, um, tens of millions of dollars. Um, they're not very visible in terms of higher defence votes. Um, when you're buying submarines and frigates, they're the kind of things that get all the publicity. But the expenditures that add up and are important, and they're quite large, um, which add to the working efficiency of the armed forces and to the comfort uh, and the uh, sense of uh, decency, uh, self-respect, uh, which the armed forces are uh, um, uh, entitled to have. Uh, these are the kind of expenditures uh, which the House should certainly support. Um, they're always made uh, too late. I mean, if you look at uh, the dates for these, it's the latter half of 1991 before uh, phase A will be uh, started. Phase B doesn't begin until after 1994, so people shouldn't get too excited, particularly the Honourable Member for McEwen, McEwen in whose electorate um, these works are being conducted, who will like to make quite a big electoral impact 
uh, of them in the forthcoming election. But it should be, uh, the House should be reminded that there's quite a big time delay in these. And also, if the Honourable Member for Fraser, the colleague of the Honourable Member for McEwen has, McEwen has his way, uh, then the defence vote will be quite substantially cut back if a Labor government is re-elected and uh, these works might well never see the light of day. So that's the kind of difficulty that uh, I think the forces uh, have to face uh, in this kind of exercise. Um, I wanted to make particular remarks about the newly formed logistic battalion at Pakapanyo, and some of the works are related to that newly formed battalion. Uh, there's a lot of activity going on in logistics and the armed forces, and I've made a number of comments about the efficiency um, and the cost effectiveness of, log of logistics uh, in the three armed services. And I have visited some of the uh, uh, logistics operations in the, in the Army, quite a few so far, not but this particular one, but it will be on my visiting, visiting schedule. And uh, I must say I pay tribute to those who have to manage these antique facilities. Um, in all, pretty well all the ones I've, uh, I've visited, um, the, uh, the accommodation has been quite ancient. Uh, in Moorbank, which I was at a week or two ago, um, there were warehouses there which I visited as an officer cadet and as a national serviceman um, in the uh, late 40s or early 50s uh, without any particular change. Um, uh, those things are gradually being changed. The people who are in charge of them are doing their very best within existing arrangements to uh, make something of them. Uh, but even in the case such as in Moorbank where you have a brand new warehouse being built and being opened um, in April of next year, um, I learned to my dismay that the computer systems, the control systems for that are um, being designed by a totally different part of the Department of Defence, uh, not coordinated with that, and the brand new facility at Moorbank in April uh, will be open without the necessary computer control facilities to make it efficient. Now, I do hope that uh, in the uh, planning and in the works for the uh, improvements for the logistic battalion, the newly formed one in Pakapanyo, uh, this same problem will not be, um, will not be uh, met. Um, and that's one of the things that I shall examine on my continuing series, uh, series of visits. But I think the most, the most important thing for the House tonight, and I'm sure the Honourable Member for McEwen will join me in this, um, is supporting uh, this, this, uh, th this reference um, in urging the House to support the funds that are required uh, to upgrade these facilities to make the working conditions of our armed services and their living conditions um, more satisfactory, up to a level which um, people in the private sector would regard um, as their everyday right and which in regretfully in many military situations are, are not. Um, and I'm not being partisan in this. I think uh, would the Honourable Member um, acknowledge that uh, various governments of various persuasions have been lax um, in looking at these less uh, um, sort of high level or visible uh, areas of defence expenditure, uh, that the House tonight should uh, support this reference and hope that these perhaps uh, can be uh, speeded up, these improvements can be speeded up. The question is that the motion be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye, of the contrary no. I think the ayes have it. Uh, the clerk. Notice number three, dedicated computer centre for the Australian Taxation Office, Bruce, ACT. The minister. Thanks, Mr. Deputy Speaker. I move that in accordance with the provisions of the Public Works Committee Act 1969, the following proposed work be referred to the Parliamentary Standing Committee on Public Works for consideration and report. I refer to the dedicated computer centre for the Australian Tax Office at Bruce ACT. Sir Deputy Speaker, this is a proposal to construct a purpose-built computer centre on Commonwealth land at Bruce and the ACT. The Australian Tax Office is undergoing a complete modernisation of its business operation and has an urgent requirement to accommodate its new computer equipment in a secure and stable environment. The existing taxation computer facility in the Treasury building has outlived its functional usefulness and cannot provide for expansion needs over the next decade. The proposed building of 6,300 square metres will consist of two levels. 
The computer mainframe and operations will be on the upper floor level, while plant, dispatch, loading dock, storage, staff amenities and office accommodation will be on the ground floor level. The Bruce site adjacent to the Fern Hill Technology Park development was found to be the most satisfying and effective location for meeting Australian tax officers' needs now and in the future. The limit of cost for the proposal is $21.85 million at December 89 prices. So I table all drawings of the proposed works and I commend this motion to the House. The question is that the motion be agreed to. The Honourable Member for Deakin. Thank you, Mr Deputy Speaker. Mr Deputy Speaker, um, I just would like to take a second, if you would indulge me, uh, to say that, uh, that the Minister has misunderstood what my friend and colleague, the member for McKellar, had to say about information being available. I want to well, say that I, I, I don't think I will indulge in that, the Honourable Member for Deakin. We've had enough indulgence this evening. I think that we will stick to the motion before the House, which is that this computer centre for the Australian Taxation Office at, the Bruce, at Bruce ACT be referred to the Public Works Committee. You can sort out the misunderstanding between the Minister and the information after, but not in the Parliament's time. Now, we'll just stick to what's well, with on the paper. Respect, well, you may have Speaker, great respect. I usually start these comments by thanking the Minister for making the information no. available to me. I start my... Co I start my comments by saying that the minister, the honourable member for Deakin, if you just hear me, the minister honest, you're has just quite right, Mr. Deputy Speaker. The minister has quite rightly pointed out that the information was available to us mid-afternoon, and that it the is now midnight. The honourable member for De oh, order, not... order. The honourable member for Deakin, look, we've canvassed this, and each each item before there, you are wasting the time of the House. You are wasting the time of the members. You are unnecessarily de delaying us here. I would ask you to confine your comments to whether this motion should be referred to the Public Works Committee or not. You can sort out other matters with other ministers in other people's time. Well, Mr Deputy Speaker, I do have well, 14 minutes uh, remaining, but uh, since neither you nor the Minister for Aboriginal Affairs wishes me to uh, thank the Minister for Administrative Services, then we'll move on to the, uh, to the motion in, uh, to, uh, that's uh, before the House. Uh, Mr Deputy Speaker, um, there, there is a clear need uh, for modernisation to take place uh, in the Australian Taxation Office. The government has been under considerable, considerable criticism for the way it requires the Australian Taxation Office to conduct its affairs, and, so. and just as my friend and colleague, the member for Morton, says, and justly so. Yeah, well, the government well, is order, order. I'd ask the Honourable Member for Morton to keep his comments to himself and not interject in the chamber. The Honourable Member for Deakin, you'll continue. Thank you, Mr Deputy Speaker. And, uh, and I thank my uh, colleague for his assistance in this matter. But there have been, uh, directed against the government, a series of complaints, Mr Deputy Speaker, about the operation of the Australian Taxation Office, justly so. and justly so. Um, they are uh, very often accused of being brusque. Uh, the government is accused in the, in the administration of the Australian Taxation Office of being arbitrary. And justly so. Uh, it's being, uh, been a, the government's been accused in its administration of the Australian Taxation Office of being unhelpful. It's being uh, accused of being uncaring. In fact, there are a whole series, a whole series of criticisms that are directed against the government. And those of us uh, out uh, where the real world is get these across our desk, Mr. Deputy Speaker, almost, uh, almost every day. A whole series of cri well, I don't know why you're interjecting. You wouldn't even speak on the motion order, before order, the House. Order, 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 order. The honourable oh, member Deacon will resume oh, his seat. The Honourable Member for Deakin will resume his seat. The Honourable the Minister on a point of order. My point of order is this. I know it is fast approaching the festive season and the Honourable Member from the Opposition who's just speaking, the Shadow Minister, I just ask him to you know, not put, a, put us... Put us... And I'd ask the, the Honourable Chair Member for Deakin will to, resume his to seat. get him to address the matter before the House and ask the member sitting behind him, who's uh, interjecting constantly, uh, to refrain from doing so, so that we can get on with the business before the House. Because the member for, uh, uh, for Deakin has consistently defied your rulings, 
and I'd ask you to, uh, to again, yet again, get in to oh, address the well, matter before the well, chamber. Well, I, I, think, I think the minister, I actually was listening very carefully uh, to what the member for Deakin was saying, and he was actually talking about taxation in general. He did, he did respond to an interjection from the Honourable Member for McEwen, and the Honourable Member for McEwen shouldn't have made that interjection, and nor should the Honourable Member for Morton be sitting there constantly interjection at his, his want. But if uh, he's just repeating all the time, and he's been in this, this chamber many, many years, and is a, is a senior member of this chamber, and knows that that is out of order, and uh, I would ask the Honourable Member for Deakin to continue his comments and to continue to relate uh, his comments to the, uh, whether this motion should go before the Public Works Committee or not. Thank you, Mr Deputy Speaker. And, uh, and I think I was uh, talking to the motion because the motion before us is about uh, as far as uh, the ACT is concerned about modernisation of the business operation of the Australian Taxation Office. And uh, as, uh, as part of my comments uh, that uh, lead to a point where we do not oppose this motion, I was saying, Mr Deputy Speaker, that uh, there is continual criticism of the government as far as its administration of the Australian Taxation Office is concerned in terms of the way the government requires the Taxation Office to deal with the Australian public. I was saying that the uh, government requires the Taxation Office or has failed to provide the facilities and resources to the Australian Taxation Office in such a way that they behave in a brusque fashion, in an arbitrary fashion, in an unhelpful fashion, in an uncaring fashion. and. Um, the government has starved the Australian Taxation Office, starved the Australian Taxation Office of order, the funds order. and resources mm. that it needs in order to do its job properly. And, Mr Deputy Speaker, uh, my colleague, the, uh, the Honourable Member for Morton, has consistently drawn to the House's attention and to the Australian public's attention the shortcomings that exist in the Australian Taxation Office, justly and, it, and justly so. And it is no secret, Mr Deputy Speaker, no secret that the member for Morton is one of the vigilant watchdogs that we have in this parliament over the operations of the Australian Taxation Office and one of the vigilant watchdogs that we have to try and ensure that the government, to try and ensure that the government gives the Australian Taxation Office the resources and the funds so that it can do its job properly. And nobody, Mr Deputy Speaker, would deny that we should have an Australian Taxation Office that does its job properly. We very badly need to have the resources, and we very badly need to have the people, and we very badly need to have the funds available to the Australian Taxation Office so that it can do its job properly. Because if it cannot do that, and if the government continues to deny those resources to it, we will find that the Australian Taxation Office, as directed by the government, continues to come under increasing public pressure in order to be fair, in order to be equitable. And the government's failure to provide those resources has resulted in this extraordinary and ongoing criticism of the Australian Taxation Office. Uh, Mr Deputy Speaker, um, it is uh, typical of the government, typical of the government, that it has squeezed uh, resources the Australian Taxation Office on the one hand, whereas on the other hand it has failed to deal with some of the abuses of the system, as uh, exemplified by a document that was tabled today in the House, although it had been previously uh, tabled in the Senate, which shows that in the, ma in the area of Aus study there is something like Order. $40 no. million dollars worth of abuse going the, on. Um, so the, while the, the, member, the member for Deakin is getting well beyond the reference to a public works committee. And, uh, well, I was talking, I was talking um, about the, uh, the government squeezing the resources mm. of the Australian Taxation Office I know what and you're telling them where they can get the money from to deal with it. I know what you're talking Anyhow, about. That's what, why I'm drawing you into line. Uh, Mr Deputy Speaker, what, Order, we, uh, not what, we want, what we want to have is a taxation office that is more efficient and more effective and more fair and more equitable. We don't want an Australian Taxation Office that is squeezed the way this government has squeezed it. We don't want to have 
a taxation office that doesn't deal with our citizens in a proper and fair way. And if the Australian Taxation Office is properly dealt with by the government, it will save, it will save money. And uh, although it wouldn't be in the government scheme of things, it certainly would under ours, where we can save government expenditure as a result of uh, better efficient uh, operations, we will be able to lower the overall taxation burden. So, Mr Deputy Speaker, I conclude by saying that the Australian Taxation Office has been badly dealt, badly dealt with by this government and, as a result of that, has developed a, a reputation uh, with the public which no operating organisation would like to have. And for that reason, Mr Deputy Speaker, the uh, Coalition does not oppose this motion. The question is the motion be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. Of the contrary, no. I think the ayes have it. The Honourable Member for Hughes, Joint Committee of Public Accounts Reports. Thank you, Mr Deputy Speaker. On behalf of the Joint Committee of Public Accounts, I, produce, I present the following reports. 300th report, reports of the Auditor General, March 8, 1988, September 1988 and April 1989. The 301st report on finance minutes. 302nd report on engagement of external consultants by Commonwealth departments. The 303rd report, review of the Auditor General's efficiency audits, Department of Defence safety principles for explosives and RAAF explosive ordnance. 304th report on annual report guidelines. The 305th report on review of finance minute on report 270, implementation of the offsets program. And I move that the reports be printed. The question is the reports be printed. Those of that opinion say aye. Of the contrary, no. I think the ayes have it. The Honourable Member for Hughes. Mr Deputy Speaker, I ask leave of the House to make a short statement in connection with the reports. Is leave granted? With Christmas charity there being no objection, leave is granted? <coughs> if he's economical in his words. Uh, Mr Deputy Honourable Speaker, I'm, I'm sub subjected to incredible duress, not the least of which is the uh, the uh, persuasive uh, uh, look of the Minister for Aboriginal Affairs at the table to ensure that my remarks are brief. Um, I will. I will. Yes. I will on the Before basis. Before the end of the decade. I will on the basis uh, of the minister's uh, uh, persuasive uh, comments to me substantially truncate my remarks. Uh, I, however, I, I do wish to uh, nevertheless do justice to these reports for a number of reasons. First of all because of my responsibilities to the parliament, and in particular the House of Representatives, my responsibilities to the staff of the committee who have put in uh, well over a year of work on, uh, on a number of these reports, and uh, also responsibilities to the public. Having said that, Mr Deputy Speaker, in relation to the 300th report of the Joint Committee of Public Accounts, in relation to reports of the Auditor General, uh, I draw the attention of members to the statements made by my colleague members of the committee in the Senate. Uh, they uh, concern uh, this report and the responsibility of the committee to follow up issues raised by the Auditor General, which have efficiency and effective implications. This report, that is number 300, outlines the issues which have concerned the Auditor General in his two reports of 1988 and April 1989 report and in particular highlight a number of areas which the Public Accounts Committee will continue to follow up. In relation to report 301, that report contains 21 finance minutes covering a broad range of Commonwealth Government activities. One important feature of that report uh, is that the committee will in future table finance minutes as soon as practicable in order to allow parliamentary and public debate uh, on these matters. This report was the subject uh, of many months of detailed work by Mr Rod Power of the Committee's Secretariat. I thank him and Mrs Jackie McConnell uh, who produced both this report and the earlier report 300 that I referred to. In relation uh, to report 302 concerning the engagement of external consultants by Commonwealth departments, despite the lateness of the hour, uh, it uh, is necessary for me to do justice uh, to this report by making a number of comments in relation to it. This report was produced uh, by the committee uh, following a number of adverse comments made by the Auditor-General 
in relation to the management of external consultants by, gov by Commonwealth government departments. And I want to stress that uh, the report was not an exercise in bashing consultants. It did not have a predetermined agenda. It was about getting the best value for the Commonwealth dollar from the use of consultants. Overall, the evidence taken by the committee revealed a situation with respect to consultants that was both confused and inconsistent across the public sector. Of particular concern to the committee was the fact that although that there were service-wide guidelines for the engagement of consultants, scant attention had been paid to them. And we had uh, what I would consider the Monty Python-esque uh, situation whereby the committee was making available to prominent mm -hmm. Uh, consultants and to senior departmental representatives copies of the Commonwealth's own guidelines for the management of consultants, some of which they had never even seen before. The committee, just to encourage you, Minister, this is a, 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 every interjection is at your peril. The committee, I wish to emphasise, doesn't, doesn't have an obsession uh, with adherence to detailed guidelines in the form of a manual of procedure. And what we found uh, in the uh, course of this inquiry was that nobody uh, challenged the guidelines put forward by the Commonwealth. In fact, it was really left mm. to the committee itself mm. uh, to challenge aspects of the guidelines. Uh, we uh, took the view that certain aspects of those guidelines ought to be mandatory in the sense that if they were not followed, poor management practices were likely to lead to a waste of public money and uh, mm. the failure to achieve uh, desired results from the use of consultants. Yeah. An obvious principle yeah. that ought to be man mandatory mm. was the issue of, of evaluation. And believe it or not, um, that wasn't a, uh, a compulsory requirement in relation to the use of consultants. We took the view that surely a major objective ought to be the development and implementation of monitoring and accountability mechanisms both for the department's own purposes and to ensure that public funds uh, were not wasted. The committee found that there were no procedures in place to ensure that consultants who performed poorly in one department were not going to be engaged by another. We therefore recommended that post-performance reviews be required for consultancies. Hardly a revolutionary recommendation, but one which is not followed under the current regime. We uh, found in the course of our report that there were a number of legal requirements which had not been complied for. Legal requirements not complied for with not for a period of one year or two years, but for 15 years consultants had been engaged contrary to the law of the Commonwealth. The committee uh, also uh, recognised that there would obviously be a continuing need for consultants. This is a bipartisan uh, view, I believe. And therefore, the committee sees merit in developing a public sector management consultancy within the public service as an option uh, of some uh, alternative to using private sector consultants. Specifically, the committee considered that there would be value in expanding the development consultants, which is an agency within the Commonwealth Public Service Commission specialising in human resource development issues into a broad-ranging man management consultancy bureau along the lines of the Canadian Bureau of Management Consultancy. The committee also recommended that consultancy units be established to assist in the selection of specialist consultants from outside the public service. Further issue of concern was that of public servants leaving the service to join or establish consultancies in what are sometimes described as revolving door and Monday to Friday syndromes. There was no legislation in place which prevented a public service employee from, from resigning a position only to return as a consultant to do precisely the same tasks at a significantly higher fee. Let me make the point that in the uh, United States considerable attention is being paid to this question. The committee found in essence a total absence of any uh, detailed concern at the Commonwealth level in relation to this matter, and we therefore recommended that the Public Service Commission play a role in that regard. Uh, the uh, committee uh, especially noted that the reforms 
that have been announced for Commonwealth purchasing, very important reforms, are very much dependent for their success on a high level of visibility and the provision of public information on government contracts, and that matter has been uh, substantially highlighted in the course of the committee's report. Mm -hmm. Mr Deputy Speaker, uh, I would also, in connection with this report, like to thank Gillian Gould and Lorraine Brennan for their work throughout the inquiry and their efforts in producing this report. Mr Deputy Speaker, I turn now to report number 303 concerning the Auditor-General's efficiency audits in relation to the Department of Defence safety principles for explosives and RAAF explosive ordnance. Again, I substantially truncate my remarks. Uh, I do not uh, draw attention uh, to the major recommendations which have been referred to elsewhere. And I understand that the member for Lowe may uh, care to address aspects of this at the conclusion of uh, my remarks on all these reports. There are, however, um, some matters that I think ought to be of concern to all members of the House. A major finding of the Auditor-General and confirmed by the committee was that successive defence ministers had not been fully briefed on important matters relevant to the NATO safety principles. These instances began as early as 1981 when the department failed to obtain the minister's approval for the adoption of the safety principles despite having received advice that such approval should be sought. Further instances of failure to adequately brief ministers were identified in subsequent years. The committee concluded that explanations offered by the Department of Defence for these failures were unacceptable. The committee was dismayed, a considered word, was dismayed to find that after a mandatory defence instruction was issued requiring ministerial approval for explosive operations that could not comply with the NATO safety principles and which involved some risk to the public should an accident occur, operations were allowed to consider to continue without explicit ministerial approval. The committee took an extremely dim view of senior unelected officials of the Department of Defence making decisions to allow non-compliant storage of explosives when, according to their own departmental instruction, having the force of law, such decisions ought to have been made by the minister. The committee noted that all such instances now have the minister's approval and the committee has made recommendations to ensure that in future the minister's approval is sought in a much more timely manner. The committee considers the findings of this report to have ramifications for all departments in, relation, in their relationships with the executive. It should serve as a reminder to all departmental secretaries of the need to ensure that ministers are adequately briefed and kept informed. Mr Deputy Speaker, what that means is unless uh, senior departmental officers brief ministers, then this place counts for nothing. It becomes a sham. The whole principle of ministerial accountability to parliament is based on ministers being briefed and informed and consulted by their departments. If that doesn't happen, then we may as well uh, turn uh, back the clock and uh, adopt some other form of, of government other than uh, Westminster parliamentary democracy, because this is what this is about. Ministers under Conservative governments and under Labor governments not being briefed by the de their departments. Inexcusable. And I repeat that this report ought to be read by all senior managers. Mr Deputy Speaker, I stress that I'm substantially truncating my remarks and I conclude uh, my comments on this report by thanking Tom Duncan for his contribution to the inquiry and to Celeste Conlon for her efforts in typing the report. This may seem, uh, Mr Deputy Speaker, a, a rather small matter, but when I conclude you'll understand uh, why I make special reference to the people behind the scenes. Mr Deputy Speaker, I'm moving towards my conclusion. In relation to Report 304 concerns guidelines for departmental uh, annual reports. And uh, in this regard, Mr Deputy Speaker, because of the lateness of the hour, I'll put aside my set uh, remarks and uh, adopt a more informal way of commenting on this report. Mr Deputy Speaker, it's long uh, concerned me as a parliamentarian that uh, the House of Representatives uh, has not had the same opportunity as has the Senate to effectively scrutinise the operations of government departments. What our report uh, sets out to do is to do uh, two things. One is to say uh, that reports of government departments ought to be routinely considered by the standing committees of the House of Representatives. 
and I am pleased to say that that view is endorsed by the Procedures Committee, which has already reported to the House, and my hope is that their recommendation will be dealt with and supported by all members of the House, because at the moment, effectively, two-thirds of the parliament isn't actively participating in the scrutiny process to the extent that it ought to. Second matter that's involved in this report uh, concerns the committee's recommendation that the performance of government departments ought to be referred to in their annual reports. The position is at the moment that members of the House of Representatives simply do not focus on these questions of performance. And if the Department of Finance and others who advance the view uh, that uh, Parliament ought to be more concerned with performance issues, and I share that view, uh, then the best way to achieve that is to involve the two-thirds of the Australian Parliament, namely the House of Representatives members, who at this time have no role at all in relation to that scrutiny. So I commend that report to the House and, uh, as I have done in another place, I commend the Procedures Committee and its chairman, uh, the member for Banks, uh, for their forthright views in relation to this matter. Final report, Mr Deputy Speaker, is the 305th report. That concerns the implementation of the offsets report. Uh, I refer the House to comments uh, by my colleagues in the Senate on this matter. This report and inquiry arose because the committee was not satisfied with the response of the uh, Department of Industry, Technology and Commerce and the Department of Defence in response to an earlier report. And it is a good example of a committee following up an earlier report uh, to ensure that appropriate reforms uh, are initiated and that accountability occurs. The committee found, uh, following that report, uh, that in some areas corrective action had either not been implemented or had not been completed, despite the fact that criticisms had been made several times in the last few years, including by the Auditor General, the English Committee of Review on Offsets in 84, and the Public Accounts Committee itself. Uh, in respect of civil offsets, there were still no proper procedures to ensure objective valuation of offsets proposals, no definitive procedure manual, no penalties for non-compliance with offsets agreement, uh, and so it went on. Of particular concern to the committee is that the matter of notification procedures, a matter which goes to the very heart of the offsets program, uh, well, there were still no proper procedures to ensure that industry, technology and commerce was aware of all Commonwealth purchases. Now, uh, this to me is, is mind-boggling. It is beyond my comprehension how uh, senior managers can't organise a system so the key government department knows when purchases are being made uh, that fall within the offsets uh, program. Uh, but nevertheless, despite all the recommendations of those independent reviews, that system is still not in place. Mr Deputy Speaker, the committee has made uh, very substantial recommendations, uh, we believe, which will overcome those problems and the other problems referred to in the report. And again, I commend those behind the scenes, Julia van der Hyde, for her considerable efforts and professionalism in assisting the committee, and Jackie McConnell for her long hours on the word processor. Mr Deputy Speaker, in concluding, I remind the House that I've tabled six reports today, and in order to uh, meet uh, those requirements, a superhuman effort, uh, I believe, was required by the committee secretariat staff and by others. Uh, we sometimes refer with a throwaway line to the good work of the House of Representatives printing office. Well, let me tell you that they worked through the night uh, to produce our reports and to do many other things uh, to allow the House to uh, finish its work in the course of the year. I therefore, and I think I can say on behalf of this House, extend personal thanks and the thanks of the House to Pat Norris, Terry Lyons, Peter Daniel, Andy Reinpacker, Andy Hall, and Anne Van Limbeek and Carol Kent. And uh, in uh, referring to my own staff, let me just quickly in 15 seconds tell you uh, an anecdote, and that is that uh, having worked till 2 a.m., I uh, was uh, checking to see that the staff of the Secretariat had finished their work, and when I rang the office, they were still hard at it, about four or five of them. I came back in the morning for an 8.30 meeting, and I felt very self-righteous that the Public Accounts Committee office was locked up, and here was I back at work, and they were obviously uh, somewhere at home. 
Then I found out after some uh, pressed interrogation that the last member of my staff um, and the staff of the committee left that office at half past six in the morning and uh, the person was there out of total dedication, uh, not getting overtime and uh, you know, out of loyalty to the parliament. Another one of the staff members actually slept in their car um, because they were so exhausted and so tired and had to be back in for, for uh, the, uh, the, the next day. But uh, that really, to me, is tremendous professional dedication you know, and a great uh, love and, uh, and uh, commitment to the work of the parliament. I just take my hat off uh, to that uh, sterling effort of those people. Mr Deputy Speaker, uh, it's the end of the year and it's just about the end of my speech. Let me say that uh, being chairman of the Public Accounts Committee is not easy. Uh, in the government party room, I sit beside the member for primary industries and energy. And uh, I think I can tell a tale out of school that he very recently <coughs> approached me and said what a good job I was doing as chairman of the Public Accounts Committee. And I suddenly realised that the reason he was able to say that was because his department was one of the few departments that the Public Accounts Committee hadn't had uh, some substantive dealings with in the course of the year. And perhaps we can remedy that in the new year. I tell that story only because uh, I want to indicate that it is not often an easy job. Sometimes it involves uh, taking a stand uh, that doesn't always in, endear me to, to ministers of the government, but uh, in all cases uh, they have allowed me to do my job, I hope with uh, independence and with integrity. I thank them and I thank the House, I thank the fellow members of the committee, and last but not least, the uh, long-suffering secretary of the committee, Trevor Rowe, who remains in the House to hear this rather long-winded speech. I thank the House. The Honourable Member for McKellar. Um, Mr Deputy Speaker, I suppose it's a measure of the values that... Uh, Are you seeking leave to make I a statement? I seek leave to make a short statement. Any objection? No objection. Leave is granted. I think the House... Um, it's probably a flexion of the values that have gradually seeped into this House over the years that I, um, with some trepidation, take a few minutes to say something about the reports that have been introduced by the Honourable Member for Hughes. But um, here we are at uh, half past midnight um, on the second last day of sitting and only a few days before Christmas, um, receiving into the House uh, some of the most important material uh, that the House would have considered in this session. Um, if we look at the work we've done even today, and I've spent some hours in the House today, and heaven forbid over the course of this session I've spent many hours in the House, uh, there would be very few half hours that I've spent here which have been more worthwhile than the last half hour in receiving the many reports. I think there were five or so uh, from the Honourable Member for Hughes as Chairman of the Joint Six. Committee on Public Accounts. Uh, now, we have to be a lot more serious about the way in which we approach government in this country. Uh, it's much more important than anybody recognises that the parliament itself uh, take a much deeper interest in the management of government. And it's certainly a subject in which I personally have taken a deep interest for a very long time. Um, I was a minister in the previous government for a relatively short time. I regretted very much uh, the absence of adequate committee support to the work I did. The Joint Committee on Public Accounts uh, at that time was a very great support to me. It conducted a number of inquiries in the department which I administered. It was a uh, committee composed of members of uh, three parties um, and uh, it uh, carried out work of immense value. And I as a minister had no concern whatever um, of that kind of analysis being extended to committees of the House of Representatives had they been established at that time because I believe that the dangers that people see uh, under the political process of members of the opposition taking advantage of the committee inquiry process being outweighed enormously uh, by the additional arms and legs that that particular process would give to a minister uh, in overseeing the extraordinarily complicated workings of a department. It is very difficult indeed for a minister with a very small professional staff in a ministerial office um, to supervise adequately uh, a Department of State, which may employ, in the case of the Department of Health when I administered it, 
um, including uh, statutory authorities, I suppose about 12,000 people, uh, spending at that time about $4 billion worth of public money, and now I think seven or eight, um, and the capacity of the minister to oversee the activities of that very complicated mechanism with two professional staff, as I had at the time, um, and with very limited external advice, uh, is a very difficult process. And uh, I must say that I was grateful to the work of the uh, Joint Committee on Public Accounts at that time for the assistance they gave me. It would have been even better had I had at that stage uh, committees of the House of Representatives with a full inquiry role. And we must look more, as the Honourable Member for s says, into the way in which committees of the House of Representatives can be further integrated into the continuing supervision of departments. I personally have to say that I have no cause for concern about the multi-party nature of those committees. Because generally speaking, uh, the impression you get about members of parliament working together is utterly different from the one you get here in question time, the bear pit you get in this particular chamber uh, in each afternoon, which bears no relationship to the cooperative working relationship that members normally have, and the very, very substantial work they do when they're locked up in private and not uh, subjected uh, to the um, baleful influence of the press. Um, so I would like, uh, generally speaking, to uh, congratulate the Honourable Member and his committee on the work that they've done, uh, to regret very much indeed the fact that it's between uh, midnight and half past midnight on our second last day that he's had to uh, introduce this very large number of very important reports. Uh, to acknowledge, as I do, the work that's gone into them of his staff in his own private office and the staff of the Public Accounts Committee itself. I know the amount of work that goes into these things. I know the degree of attention that he personally, the members of his committee, uh, devote to uh, the production of those reports. But the message we ought to leave with the House, and I hope with the whole Parliament, uh, is that let us hopefully, in the next Parliament, uh, take a much more constructive approach to these matters and not spend so much of the time of this House every day in totally unconstructive nonsense which I'm afraid uh, is the hallmark of the way in which the House of Representatives uh, has tended to operate in recent years. And I'm not being um, partisan in this. It's happened uh, under more than one government. Um, and I would hope that uh, if there is a change of government, that my colleagues and I uh, would devote ourselves to uh, satisfactory change. When I first came into this place 12 years ago, I was told that after I'd been here for a while, I would understand that a lot of the procedures and processes that I saw uh, were very worthwhile, and once I'd been here for quite a long time, I would understand why they were necessary. I can only say to you, Mr Deputy Speaker, and to the Speaker who's President and the Leader of the House, that after 12 years in the House and observing these processes and practices, I can only say that I regard them in many respects as even more lunatic than I thought they were when I first arrived. The Honourable Member for Lowe. I seek leave to make a brief statement to the 303rd report, please. Leave granted. There being no objection, leave is granted. The member to to make a short statement. I just wish to address the uh, question of the storage of the explosives in Sydney Harbour, as discussed in the uh, 303rd report of the Public Accounts Committee. Uh, I'd like to point out that it was actually known as far back as 1956 that the Navy was not complying with safety instructions and that the only solution uh, to that non-compliance was to move out of Sydney and that subsequently in 1981 and 84, safety and waivers instructions were indeed issued uh, to allow the Navy to get around this problem. Uh, now clearly at that time the Navy should have informed the Minister if the Navy could not comply with these, uh, and indeed should have asked the Minister for approval to continue operations, but as the uh, Honourable Member has already said, uh, this was not in fact done until 1988, years after the problem arose. And uh, the Committee found that time and time again there was a need to obtain approval when compliance with the regulations was not possible and when as a result of that local residents were in fact put at risks from the explosives stored in Sydney Harbour. But again for years nothing was done. Clearly as we have said in the report ministers were not brief and the, uh, the expression of the committee was that we were dismayed by this lack of action, lack of information given to both the current minister and to his predecessors. And it gives uh, rise to the question as to what sort of control the Minister does have over his department in regard to this matter. 
But almost as bad as this was the, uh, the finding by the committee that the Navy spent $1.4 million installing moorings during 1988, only come to come to a decision that after all of this uh, expenditure, the explosives did not, and indeed probably never had, needed to be staged at Spectacle Island, since it was possible for them to be transferred from Garden Island to Newington in one day without the, uh, the overnight R&R, uh, &R, if you like to call it, at uh, Spectacle Island. So they ceased storage of explosives at Spectacle Island, in fact some seven months after the installation of the piles. Presumably a decision taken at the time they were spending the $1.4 million to put in the piles for the barges which were no longer going to store explosives there. It seems to me amazing that the, the minister didn't know what was going on. Um, it seems to me that he, he really couldn't run a department appropriately. I mean, he couldn't run a game of hopscotches. This is in fact the, the situation as it appears to be. And I, I have to say, it doesn't seem to me to be good enough, as the minister did previously, to palm the blame off onto his department by saying he was kept in the dark by his department. The uh, doctrine of ministerial responsibility clearly means that he is in, in fact responsible for the, the problem. Brings me to the question of the usage of Spectacle and Snapper Islands. The only remaining use that the Navy has for Spectacle Island, according to the evidence that we received, was in the unlikely case of a major emergency. It was never clear to me why, if an emergency occurred, the Navy couldn't follow the same procedures as it does at present, i.e. to transfer any explosives from the ships involved in the emergency direct to Newington. But it also claimed, the Navy, in any case, it had to store the lifting equipment used for handling explosives at Spectacle Island. And that, because of this, the whole of Spectacle Island had to be off limits to non-Navy personnel, a restricted zone. I, I find this somewhat mysterious, as it seems to imply that the Navy has such sort of top secret lifting equipment that it wants to protect it from the prying eyes of you know, perhaps the KGB. I don't understand why the equipment needed to be stored there and why it couldn't be stored at either Newington or Garden Island. If that were the case, then of course the Navy could make uh, one of the most worthwhile gestures possible in this area, both geographically and portfolio areas, it could vacate Spectacle Island and return it to the people of Sydney. Clearly the Navy doesn't need it. It doesn't need it for storage of explosives or for associated equipment. It doesn't need it as a contingency for future problems. Uh, and I might point out that this beautiful island really is very much a part of our local heritage. Uh, it's got, for example, half a dozen buildings built before 1865 and some 30 built before the turn of the century. And I believe very strongly it should be accessible to the people of Sydney, not jealously guarded by the Navy. And in conclusion, I might just mention the question of Snapper Island, which is uh, some 50 or so metres from Spectacle Island. It's the home of the Sydney Training Depot, a corps of sea cadets who, I might point out, largely reclaim the land from the harbour waters with the use of fill from places like neighbouring Cockatoo Island. And this corps has been part of our community for some years, more than 50 in fact. It offers our kids a worthwhile training and discipline, team spirit, and really needs to be strongly encouraged. But the Navy as the uh, owner, if you like, of Snapper Island, took out eviction proceedings in 1987 uh, against the Sea Cadets because, of course, the island was theoretically in the blast zone of Spectacle Island explosives. Uh, I might point out the Cadets have now applied for another lease. And clearly, now that there are no explosives, the committee found and uh, states in its report that there was no apparent reason for the Navy and more recently the Department of uh, Administrative Services uh, and the Department of Defence, of course, not renewing their lease. And the uncertainty about the uh, Snapper Island hangs over the head of the sea cadets uh, like a Damoclean sword, if you like. I, I, I really think the government should remove this, uh, this problem immediately and uh, renew the lease for these sea cadets, which are such a boon to our, our local youth. I too would like to join with the uh, member for Hughes in uh, taking this opportunity to commend the staff of the committee for their, their tireless uh, and indeed exemplary work in relation to this and other reports. In relation to this report in particular, Tom Duncan, and I would like to point out uh, the untiring work of uh, Trevor Rowe, who is sitting in the gallery at this moment, and endorse the, the comments of the member for Hughes in this regard. The Honourable Member for McEwen. Thank you, Mr Speaker. On behalf of the Joint Committee on the National Crime Authority, I present the third report of the committee, incorporating a dissenting report, and I move that the report be printed. The question is that the motion be agreed to. All those of that opinion, please say aye. Those against, no. I think the ayes have it. Thank you, Mr Speaker. I ask leave of the House to make a short statement in connection with the report. Leave granted. Leave is granted. The Honourable Member for McEwen. 
The Parliamentary Joint Committee on the National Crime Authority has a duty under Section 55 of the National Crime Authority Act 1984 to monitor and to review the performance by the National Crime Authority of its functions and to report to both Houses of the Parliament on any matter connected with the performance of the authority's functions to which, in the opinion of the Committee, the attention of the Parliament should be directed. The Committee fulfils its monitoring and reviewing function by keeping a watch on what the Authority is doing and examining suggestions that the Authority has not been performing its statutory functions or that it has abused its powers. At the Committee's regular meetings with the Authority, the Committee is briefed on matters such as the Authority's staff and resources, legislative and other constraints impacting upon the Authority's ability to perform its functions effectively, the Authority's relations with other agencies, its strategic, strategic planning and procedures, completed investigations and operations which have entered the public domain. The committee is not, however, briefed on matters which the authority considers to be operationally sensitive. The committee's regular meetings with the authority also provide a forum for the committee to raise with the authority matters of concern in relation to the authority's performance of its functions. Thus, the committee has sought explanations in relation to prosecutings or prosecutions arising out of the authority's investigations which have failed at the committal stage of proceedings. Allegations of interference in the authority's operations by politicians or officers of other law enforcement agencies and suggestions of inadequacies in the authority's arrangements for the protection of witnesses. In addition to the oral briefing provided its regular meetings with the authority, the committee also receives written briefing material from the authority, including detailed briefs on each of the authority's investigations. The committee has also sought and received from the authority specific documents to supplement material provided by way of oral briefing and explanation. The committee has presented two previous reports to the parliament pursuant to its monitoring and reviewing function. The first report in November 1985 and the second report in November 1986. In May 1988, the committee tabled a report entitled The National <coughs> Crime Authority and Initial Evaluation in which it supported the passage of legislation repealing the Sunset Clause in the National Crime Authority Act of 1984, which would otherwise have resulted in the authority ceasing to exist on the 30th of June 1989. However, the committee considered that it was only possible to make an initial evaluation of the authority's performance at that time, since many of the authority's investigations were not completed and legal proceedings were before the courts or pending in a number of matters arising out of the authority's investigations. The committee therefore recommended that a more comprehensive evaluation of the authority's work and of the success of the law enforcement strategy underpinning the establishment of the authority be undertaken after the authority had been in existence for seven years. That recommendation did not mean, however, that the committee did not intend to continue to fulfil its duty of monitoring and reviewing the performance by the authority of its functions in the meanwhile. And it is pursuant to that duty that the committee presents this, its third report, to the parliament. Its purpose is to report on matters connected with the authority's performance of its functions during the period since the committee presented its second report, and in particular to report on the committee's examination of some of the authority's investigations which may have given rise to public concern that the authority was not performing its functions properly. The report examines in some detail two of the five cases arising out of investigations by the authority which failed at the committal stage of proceedings in the course of the past year. The committee had intended to deal with all five of the cases, but three of them remain before the courts. The committee is satisfied that the authority took action in the two cases dealt with in the report only after careful investigation and after receiving advice from counsel that prima facie cases against the accused existed. The authority cannot be blamed for the fact that other factors, such as new evidence, arose which resulted in the charges being dismissed or withdrawn. The committee is confident that the authority carried out its statutory responsibilities correctly in assembling admissible evidence in relation to these matters and in forwarding that evidence to the responsible prosecuting authorities. The report touches on a number of other matters, including the need for the authority to be sensitive to the demands it places on individual witnesses appearing before it, the costs of the present system for telecommunications interception and the authority's resources. It also contains detailed statistics on the authority's investigations, bringing up to date similar tables which appeared in the committee's initial evaluation report. The period covered by the report saw the end of Mr Justice Stewart's term as chairman of the authority, and it is appropriate to remark that, as the foundation chairman of the authority, Mr Justice Stewart deserves much of the credit for establishing, as a working reality, 
what was a unique and novel concept in law enforcement. This comment is not intended to discount the very significant contribution made by other members of the authority over the past five years, nor the dedication and hard work of the many members of staff who have helped over that time to build the reputation of the authority as an effective element of this country's law enforcement machinery. However, nobody can deny that the authority in its first five years bore the stamp of Mr Justice Stewart's personality, nor that, in significant respects, it reflected his experience as a Royal Commissioner inquiring into the Mr Asia Drug Syndicate, the Nugent Hand Bank and the illegal interception of telephone calls by the New South Wales Police. The task that Mr Justice Stewart was set as the Foundation Chairman of the Authority was a difficult one. Not only was he required to build a new agency, the very existence of which was fiercely resented by many within the existing law enforcement structure of the country, but the legislation also contained a sunset clause which would have resulted in the Authority ceasing to exist after a period of five years unless the Parliament passed a further law to the contrary. The Authority was thus under pressure to prove itself and to do so quickly even though the investigation of organised crime is a lengthy process and it takes even longer for the results of investigation to be processed by a criminal justice system. As the committee commented in its initial evaluation, there was an expectation on the part of the parliament in establishing the authority that it would get results, that it would put important or significant criminals behind bars. This, the authority under the uh, chairmanship of Mr Justice Stewart did. To mention but one investigation, the authorities Operation Iliad concerns the illegal importation and distribution of drugs, especially heroin, by persons of Chinese origin and their associates and the financing of the importation and distribution of such drugs. The Australian Federal Police had initiated a similar investigation but had met with little success. At the time the investigation was taken over by the authority at the request of the Australian Federal Police. Some targets had been identified, but no substantive police investigation of them had been undertaken. The authorities' investigation has so far resulted in the charging of 93 people on a total of 198 charges. 67 prosecutions have been completed, resulting in 39 convictions and 15 deportations. The significance of this investigation is reflected in the amount of heroin seized, almost 60 kilograms and the severity of these sentences imposed on those persons who have been convicted. The measure of the authority's success lies not only in the number of convictions of significant criminals arising from its investigations, but also in the fact that it is unlikely that many of these convictions would have occurred without the authority. Other agencies had already attempted investigations in some of the cases and had been unable to launch prosecutions. While in the case of former Chief Inspector Barry Moyes in South Australia, for example, it was acknowledged that the offences might not have been uncovered but for the intervention of the authority. Moreover, in some areas it appears that the authority has not only broken new ground but that it has stimulated other law enforcement agencies to follow it. The committee understands that the authority was the first law enforcement agency in Australia to employ Chinese speaking officers from Hong Kong to assist in the investigation of criminal activity among Chinese elements in Australia. Now the Australian Federal Police are also experiencing some success in this area in cooperation with the authorities in Hong Kong. <coughs> While the committee considers that the complete change in the membership of the authority, apart from the member in charge of the Adelaide office, Mr Legrand, which took place in July 1989, was undesirable from the point of view of continuity in the authorities' investigations, it has undoubtedly given the new chairman, Mr Peter Farris, QC, the opportunity to place his stamp on the authority in turn. The committee looks forward to a continuation of the authority's record of success under its new chairman. It is appropriate, uh, Mr Speaker, that I give thanks to the members of the committee for the work they've done this year to pay recognition to the work of the secretary, Mr Giles Short, and to his assistant, Ms Rosa Ferranda without uh, whose help the committee would not be able to function. Finally, and in conclusion, Mr Speaker, let me say that I have some concern still on the difficulty being experienced in Australian law enforcement by conflict between existing police forces, both state and federal, and with the NCA. There does appear still to be a certain amount of jealousy between existing police forces, a certain amount of desire to be the ones who catch the big crooks 
and that the cooperation could be well improved between those bodies. There is also a concern that because of corruption which exists in some state police forces, that law enforcement is still not being properly uh, addressed because of the reluctance on the part of other law enforcement officers to exchange necessary information. I believe though that there are changes, there has been an improvement in the police forces in Australia of recent years and with other members of the committee I look forward to future successes of all law enforcement agencies. Leader of the House, questions the House do now adjourn. The Honourable Member for Dobell. On the 20, oh, thank you, Mr. Speaker. On the 23rd of November, I outlined to the House what I described as the most outrageous rip-off that I have ever encountered as a member of Parliament. I tabled documents demonstrating that Dr. John Page of Wyong had touted for investments from his patients, and that a 60-year-old widow, Mrs. Joan Gardner, had entrusted her life savings, amounting to over $82,000, to Dr. Page. Dr. Page has now refused for eight months to return her life savings apart from one measly payment of $250 and a second payment of $1,000. Mrs Gardner is destitute and may have to sell her home because of Dr Page's actions. Dr Page refuses to say what has happened to Mrs Gardner's money, but claims that overseas interests, represented by James Crowell and Associates, are about to pay Dr Page a large, large sum of money to buy his investment scheme. Yesterday, the officers of Dr Page and James Crowell and Associates in Wagga were searched by the New South Wales Police following an investigation of my allegations and other complaints made by people who entrusted money to Dr Page. I understand that at least a dozen, at least a dozen people, including patients of Dr Page, have invested up to six-figure sums with Dr Page. Dr Page's wife, on, a current affair, on the current affair program on the 24th of November, described the investment scheme as a mathematical system which could be applied to racing and was an absolute certainty. Dr Page has often boasted to people in my electorate that he has developed the perfect betting system, using computers to record past performances of horses. Mrs Gardner and many other investors were never told that their money was being used to fund Dr Page's betting bank. I am pessimistic that investors can ever expect to see their money again. Two of Dr Page's elderly patients, Mr and Mrs Pearce of Tuggerwan, were personal friends of mine and sadly they passed away last year. Bert Pearce suffered from a very severe sight disability. I believe that they invested more than $50,000 with Dr Page. However, Dr Page has cleverly avoided giving investors any detailed documentation on their investments. Dr Page now claims that Mr and Mrs Pearce only invested $10,000 and that he had verbal instructions from the Pearces to invest part of their money in a horse racing syndicate. I find it hard to believe that any doctor could stoop so low as to persuade one of his, his uh, sick and elderly patients to invest money in a horse syndicate. Dr Page has not only betrayed the trust of his patients by touting for investments and seeking financial gain for himself, but I believe he has set out to milk the assets of elderly people such as Mr and Mrs Pearce by persuading them to put their life savings in such risky schemes as this horse racing syndicate. At this stage, I would seek leave from the House to table a number of documents concerning Dr Page. Leave granted. Leave is granted. I thank the House. Letters A to I are correspondence between Dr Page and the lawyers acting for the estate of Mr and Mrs Pearce. They demonstrate that Mrs Gardner is not the only person who receives letters from Dr Page promising payment but never delivering. Dr Page's wife, Mrs Colleen Page, uh, ran the surgery office for, for her husband and also kept his records. Letter J is a pyramid-style letter which Mr and Mrs Page sent to Dr Page's patients, their neighbours in Wyong, and even friends from the local school kindergarten seeking to make money from this scheme. It is, it is a typical chain letter which asks people to send money to Mrs Page and others so that, they can, uh, so that, they, so that uh, the recipients can then learn how to get money from other people. These chain letters are illegal and I believe it is grossly improper conduct for any doctor to seek to use pyramid, pyramid selling techniques to make money by sending this type of material to his own patients. I've also, I have also received information that in 1985, Dr Page was found to have in his possession approximately 40 Medicare cards belonging to the residents of a nursing home in my electorate. Dr Page hand, handed out uh, a letter, which I've also tabled, to residents after being made to return the Medicare cards. And anyone reading that letter would see uh, how despicable Dr, Dr Page's behaviour has become. I believe it's improper for any doctor to have in his possession the Medicare cards of nursing home patients. I call on the Health Insurance Commission and the New South Wales Medical Complaints Unit to investigate this and the other improper activities which I have explained to the House tonight and last November. 
Dr Page has assured patients that their investments are safe because he is about to sell his perfect investment scheme through Mr James Crowell and Associates of Wagga. I have received information that Mr James Crowell has been a bankrupt for some time, and I am very concerned that uh, anyone could believe that Mr Crowell would be able to assist Dr Page repay the investments. Dr Page has also told patients that he intends to sue, sue me for speaking out, for, uh, out about the way he has ripped off Mrs Gardner and other elderly constituents of mine. I challenge Dr Page to do his best to sue me. I would welcome any opportunity for Dr Page to be forced to come clean on what he has done with the hundreds of thousands of dollars he took from Central Coast residents. If Dr Page's threat to sue me proves to be as empty and hollow as his promises to repay money to my constituents, I'm sure the residents of the Central Coast will quickly form their own opinion as to who to believe. The question is that the House do now adjourn. The Honourable Member for Wakefield. Thank you, Mr Speaker. Mr Speaker, I'm very conscious of the hour and I do not intend to delay the House. In fact, I do not intend, if it is possible for me, to truncate my remarks to take even my five minutes. But the matter I want to bring to the attention of the House and to the attention of the Minister for Primary Industry concerns the Riverland area of South Australia, an area with which I am very familiar and uh, in which, in fact, I have spent the greater part of my life. Mr Deputy Speaker, during the last week the Riverland area of South Australia has been in turmoil because two of the commodity groups in the area, namely the dried apricot growers and the citrus growers, have been most concerned about the difficulty they are facing from what they see as unfair uh, imports of goods from overseas in both the citrus concentrate juice area and in the dried apricot area. In the case of citrus concentrate juice, the source of the juice is Brazil, and in the case of dried apricots, the source of dried apricots into the Riverland is, in fact, from Turkey. Mr Deputy Speaker, so concerned have apricot growers been that over the last week they have, in fact, been picketing the canners in the area and the dried fr vine fruit receival places in the area, um, refusing to deliver fruit to these places unless the price for the fruit is raised. I happen, sir, to think this is, uh, um, if you'll pardon the pun, a rather fruitless exercise, but I must go on to say that the growers do have some cause for concern, and it's that cause for concern that I want to bring to the attention of the House tonight. In the case, Mr Deputy Speaker, of imported Turkish dried apricots, we need to realise that the Turks produce something like 30,000 tonnes of dried apricots in a year, and if you consider how much effort it takes to take a dried apricot, which is a relatively small item, and produce 30,000 tonnes of it, that's a large exercise. It makes the Turks the largest dryers of apricots in the world. The second largest dryers of apricot fruit in the world are Australians, and in fact Australia dries little more than six or 7,000 tonnes in a good year. The concern that Australian growers have, sir, is twofold. First, they've expressed a concern that the fruit coming into Australia does not meet under import standards the same rigorous standards as are applied to our export fruit. And I want to bring that attention to the, that to the attention of the appropriate minister. And secondly, they are concerned, sir, because not only is the price depressed, but they believe the Turks enjoy an unfair advantage in that they are recognised as a developing country and so are accorded developing country status in tariff terms when one could at least observe that Turkey seems to have spent about 2,000 years as a developing country. The citrus growers in the Riverland are similarly concerned, sir, because they face competition from Brazilian imports. The Brazilian citrus growers produce only fruit for juice and is concentrated citrus juice that comes into Australia. The citrus industry in Australia is an export-oriented industry, and what is exported is whole fruit against competition from other producers around the world. In the case of the Brazilians, however, they are not an export industry in the whole fruit term, but they are in fact simply the exporters of juice fruit. And in order for the Australian industry to be an effective exporter, it must take its best fruit and select it for export, which means that there is an overrun that inevitably finds its way onto the juice market. Sir, so just as the apricot growers are concerned about the developing country status uh, accorded the Turks, the citrus growers are concerned that the Brazilians who are far and away the world's most efficient producers of oranges and of concentrated orange juice are also afforded developing country status and so provide an unfair competition for the existing Australian growers. I bring both of these matters to the attention of the House, sir, because it is summer and uh, it is in fact a, the, about to be the height of the apricot season 
and I think the minister ought to be aware of the competition that apricot growers are feeling and of the turmoil that's currently being expressed in the Riverland area about these two potential export industries. Questions that the House do now adjourn. All those of that opinion please say aye. Those against no, I think the ayes have it. The House stands adjourned until 9.30am today. Room, along with a syringe, half a small packet of pure heroin and a bottle of sleeping pills. Australian Embassy officials said the dead man's name would not be released until residents have been notified. That's ABC News up to date for this hour. We'll have more ABC News in an hour. I will never